Hello, coaches. Well, here we are. For all of you that have been following along, we finally made it to the end. We are at episode number five, and we are pleased that our guest today is Wade Russell. Wade is one of the assistant coaches with Western University Men's Hockey. He is also a skills and player development specialist with TPH out of, based out of London, Ontario. Um, I had the opportunity to meet Wayne last summer at Calgary as we both wrapped up our Hockey Canada Skills Certification Program. Um, and it, it didn't take long for me to realize that Wade was a both academically and practically in his day-to-day -day work. Um, a, a practitioner of everything we've been talking about with Stu and Ed and Rob, um, using the environment as a, as a tool for development, ecological dynamics, the constraints-led approach, doing things representatively so that they mirror the game, bringing perception into the practice environment. So we're going to have a really great chat with, with uh, Wade today. He's got some drills to show us. We're going to dig today more into constraints-led approach and representative design. But before we kick off with our line of questioning for Wade, Wade, welcome. I'm going to hand it over to you for a few minutes, let you give the audience and the coaches a little bit more background and depth on uh, your academic background in these areas and uh, your practical background in the hockey world. Yeah, well, thanks so much uh, for having me on. I think, you know, the fact that um, I'm so new on this journey. I really feel like the fact that I get to be the last one in this whole series and line of, you know, really um, ground movers in, in this space, I think, with respect to coaching, ecological dynamics, constraint-led approach, nonlinear pedagogy, all of these terms that I'm sure coaches are, you know, chewing on a, a lot more now, thanks to you. It, it's, it's pretty surreal that I get to be the one to kind of end this off. So I want to thank you so much for, for thinking of me and incorporating me in this process. And I really do want to start by hoping that coaches have gotten a lot of value out of this. Um, it can be something that I even, and I'll talk about my, my journey through this in a moment, um, but I know that it's something that's challenging. And then there's days where I'm constantly questioning, you know, am I doing it the right way? Is this something, because I work in a little bit of the private sector a little bit, and I'll talk about that with TPH. But there's a lot of eyeballs on us, and it can be really hard to change when you are being observed. So I just want to encourage coaches to, you know, try yeah. to, to be okay to make what some people might perceive as mistakes or missteps uh, with an audience in pursuit of becoming a better coach. But um, as Brian said, I, um, 27 years old, about to turn 28. And I, this journey really started for me in high school. I actually took a special high school major in a leadership and exercise and athletics program. And the reason I mentioned that is I ended up getting to do passion projects and I didn't have a traditional curriculum. We spent half our day out in the community at rehab facilities. And part of it actually, EPH, who I work for here in London, Total Package Hockey, I actually started out as a co-op. I was just looking to get a little bit of workplace experience in coaching. Um, so my coaching journey started back in grade 11, and I actually wrote a paper on long-term athletic development models of kind of the big four hockey uh, countries um, at the time. So we did Sweden, Finland. Um, I did a little bit on Russia as well, and then Canada, and of course, the US, and just compared models where they stood back in about 2011 and 12. So that kind of got my hamster wheel spinning as I was playing just a little bit of junior and kind of was tinkering around with where my playing career would go. Um, and that led me on a, a bit of a blended blended learning journey. I quite honestly spent most of my time still teaching and coaching at Total Package Hockey as a on-ice instructor. I was pushing pucks and stations and then I moved my way up to lead a group in the corner. And then next thing you know, I'm running ice times all the while pursuing uh, my degree in kinesiology at Western. Um, still just learning, asking questions, surrounding myself with really bright and intelligent people in the sport. Um, and, and it was right as COVID started, I actually made the decision to, to pursue a master's. I took a chance. Um, and I decided to do my master's in sports, um, sport coaching and leadership at Michigan State University. And it actually worked out really well that as COVID kind of hit, I had a lot of time to sit with a lot of different ideas as our sport was, you know, first to close, last to open in hockey rinks. So I had a lot of time to kind of evaluate who is I as a coach? What is my philosophy? What do I believe in in terms of development? And really tinker with that. And then I would still say constraint-led approach and all of these terms that you've all been introduced to, I really still was teetering with in terms of how much do I believe it? Is it, you know, is it this new thing? Is it something that we've always known? We just didn't really understand it all that well. And I'll get into that. But it, it, the light bulb really actually didn't go off until I did my teaching degree, my third and final degree, the last one I'm doing. Uh, but in that degree, I was introduced to teaching games for understanding. And I think, Brian, that was a conversation that we had, uh, TGFU, um, 
back in, in, in Calgary during our, our skills coach seminar, where I think we really started to connect and be like, that's where for me, the light bulb went off. I actually got to do a tennis lesson um, where I was taught essentially all the mechanics of tennis. I didn't play a lot of racket sports growing up. And I was taught essentially how to move and how to shift my weight and how to address the racket all while playing basically games for two hours uh, every once a week for like four weeks straight. And then we got dropped into tennis. We were not told one rule about tennis. We were not told one technical aspect. And I ended up for my first time playing tennis since probably eight or nine at a tennis basketball camp. I was blown away at how well I could already kind of move. And so then I started thinking, I'm like, okay, there's something to this. Uh, there's something to this idea that you can create environments and you can manipulate constraints and rules and tweak the task that you ask of the player um, and ask questions. And I'll get into questioning as a method of instruction as well that suits it very nicely. But I, that there's something to this. Um, and I still struggled with hockey specifically because I don't find there's a lot of resources for it in which you're doing such a great job of. But yeah, I think my journey through, through academics and, and being able to coach at the same time has really allowed me the opportunity to kind of tinker and explore and to fail and to make tweaks all throughout that have kind of led me to this moment with you now. So I'm super excited to be here and I can't wait to really kind of dive into it. Well, we're thrilled that you're here. Um, I know I am because it was, it was, a, it was a, a very positive moment last year in Calgary when I realized that somebody else was at the seminar that was looking at things we were doing on the ice with the same eye and the same, in the same kind of spectrum that I was and trying to find in everything we did on ice, trying to look at it from how can I take it away from that and move it into an environmental or representative activity where I can play with the constraints and manipulate things and, and get the learning to happen that way rather than we're going around cones or we're, we're, we're doing what I call ISO or, or Ted calls ISO and I call isolation. So let's jump right in here. Wait. Yep. Uh, I kind of, before the recording started, I had said to you, I kind of, and, and, and for the benefit of the coaches, we're, we're kind of going to look, look mostly at two things today. Uh, and and they're, they're topics that have been kicked around for the previous four episodes, but this is our chance today with Wade to look at them from a very practical perspective and hopefully hopefully connect some dots that may not have connected for you. So we're going to look mostly at the constraints-led approach, what that is, how Wade can explain it, how he can show us, how he uses it, what constraints are, and then kind of embedded in that coaches, we're going to always be kicking around this notion of keeping the activities we do representative of the game. So rather than stripping them down to what I referred to yesterday when speaking with Ted, bare metal isolation, where it doesn't look like the game, feel like the game. It's very technical. It's very motor or mechanically driven. We want to look today at how can we do things that feel like the game, act like the game, and then play with it. Play with it and massage it so that the athletes inside of it are constantly being challenged to be dynamic and perceive and learn and all that great stuff. So question number one for you, Wade, Wade right out of the gate. How do you describe, and again, we've got a wide range of coaches that are, that are listening to this podcast. How do we describe for them what the constraints-led approach is? So a coach who's listening to this going, it's kind of captivating me. I'd like to try it, but I'm not quite sure if I really understand what it is for me as a hockey coach. How would you break that down for them? Yeah, so I think... When, when I try to articulate the coaches, especially in, in a fairly approachable way, a lot of us, and myself included, like my first few years in that co-op position with TPH and even beyond that, I taught in what I came to know as a very serial-based manner. I did A, and then I did B, and then I did C. So, for example, with a wrist shot, I would spend a lot of time talking about um, a weight shift would be the first thing that we talk about. And then we'd talk a little bit about loading the puck to a certain area. And then we would talk about hands away from the body, and then timing of the push or the snap, and then a follow-through very serial based seven athletes come see me in a week all seven have received the same serial based instruction for the most part within reason i still personalize it and try to be fun but in general my my coaching book in my brain says a then b then c and so on and there's a variety for for whatever skill we're talking about so a constraint-led approach kind of flips this idea on its head that there is a sequential manager learning but it we're actually as coaches we can lead through constraining the athlete through three different types of constraints, a task constraint, 
an individual constraint, which we actually don't always have control of, um, we generally don't have control of, and then an environmental constraint. And so those things actually start to bring in some of the other conversations you've had, like representative design, um, environment, and just the environment in general, which Ted did such a great job of the importance of that within the space of hockey specifically. So a constraint-led approach sees coaches view the space and the individual with, with which is acting within the space and how those things are interacting on top of the task at hand, right? So I, I, what I always try to use as an analogy, so to speak, is if I pause right now and ask every coach on this call who's listening or, or watching the podcast afterwards, do you believe that backyard rinks and pond hockey are beneficial for the development of athletes? I'd like to think every person that's listening, watching is putting their hand up and presumably agreeing to some extent. I want to say yes. To, to me, the backyard rink is the perfect analogy for constraint-led approach. You have the individual constraint. Every kid shows up with a different length stick, the different kind of quality of tape job on it. They're all different heights. They're different sizes. They have different parkas on. They have different skates on. Maybe one wore a helmet. Maybe one didn't wear a helmet. Individual constraints inherent to them. Then you have the task constraint. Did you have no goalies and you, everything was posted in? Did you have to hit some type of bar to get a goal? Did you turn the nets around and you actually had to get in behind it to try to score a goal? Did you have the really little nets that only allow you to pass? Or did you have large nets and you had to go bar down? Right? The task changes. Everybody shows up to the pond hockey that day, the backyard rink, and says, hey, here's what we're doing. Here's the rules. Great. Three on the side, two on the side. Line changes when we say line changes after two minutes every time. Task constraints change. And then there's, of course, the environmental constraint, the quality of the ice, the shape, how much did you shovel off that day? Is it a little snowy in the, snowy in the other corner because Jeff got a little lazy and you know wanted to sit in a snowbank for a minute or two? Those are all environmental constraints that are acting upon the athlete. I do not need to go there as a coach for them to actually even get some value out of that. Now, in theory, with a constraint-led approach as a coach, if I can start to look at the game through that lens and manipulate those three different factors, realistically too, again, I can't always change the individual constraints. I can maybe change a curve or a length or a flex of a stick um, and some of the things that are inherent to the individual, but I can't change necessarily the length of their femur and their shin angle and all these crazy things some skating coaches will get into. Um, but I can show up and I can tweak the task and try to push them in a certain direction. And I can maybe tweak the environment, the shape of it, right? The space of it uh, to also try to push them into, again, what have been called affordances or opportunities for action. So fancy, fancy words, basically, if there's a behavior I'm trying to get out of the athlete, rather than going up to them, tapping them on the shoulder and say, hey, you know what, this part of the drill, do this. I tweak something in the drill or in my instructions to get them to do it a little bit more organically, which that's where you start to get into what is we, we often talk about uh, as self-organization. I think Ted got into that quite a bit as well and, and all the other experts that you've had so far. So, so yeah, in a nutshell, it is it, it is a strategy for a coach or really it's a lens, I think, with which you view the game and you view the sport or whatever activity you're operating in through that allows you to provide at its best a more enriching learning opportunity for an athlete than more traditional serial based designs allow. Not that they don't ever work, but I just think that across the masses, you're going to get a lot more out of a constraint led approach when you spend the time trying to understand it. I'm still very much in that process. I do not come here with an absolute wealth of expertise. What I love about my situation is I'm learning alongside, hopefully, a lot of these coaches who are, or are learning from this series as well. And I'm just hoping to share what I've learned so far. Now, you talked about inside this approach, which it's very environment-based, right? It's, you're, you're basically saying that coaches that use this approach or methodology or uh, framework, whatever we want to call it, model, if you use this, it, it's going to change the way you look at the game or look at how you teach the game. Absolutely. Does, does it change both? Like when I you say so. it's the lens that you view the game with, I, I started out and I still, I think, tend to feel that it's more of changing the lens on how I view teaching the game as opposed to the game. Is there a distinction to be made there? I think so. You know, and I think you're actually seeing this narrative shift a little bit as well, even at the professional ranks. You hear the word principles used a lot more now. Like these yes. are our principles. You know, principles, they're, they're fairly well defined, but they're not absolute in the sense that they're going to look a little bit different every single time. 
whereas systems traditionally within the game are taught very exact. You know, Babcock has that line of exactism where it's if your stick isn't on the dot in this system of our PK uh, in zone, you're not in the system. Whereas you look at a principal approach, it allows for a little bit more degree of interpretation by the athlete, which look, it does also cause errors. Um, but at the same time, I think that every system is ultimately built upon principles. You can't talk about a neutral zone four check in hockey if you don't know how to stay above the hockey puck, right? Like that's a principle. It's going to look a little bit different every time. Each athlete based on their skating ability, their ability to cross over, their ability to get stick on puck or feel comfortable with contact, they're going to go about it a little bit differently. Some better than some, some, some weaker than some. But I could watch hockey seven or eight different times and be like, yep, that player's staying above the puck. There'll be other times where I can't necessarily spot the structure. And so I think that's where there's a bit of a shift with the constraint-led approach. It becomes a little bit easier to influence certain principles with which the game is played than you would if you just taught outright structures that are, are very well defined and rigid. And there is a place for them. Absolutely. It creates a certain amount of predictability within the sport. I'm not arguing that, but again, from a player development and a skill development lens, if you want to get a player to act within those systems better, then you need to teach from a principle standpoint, which I think a constraint led approach suits very well. That's a really, really neat comment because I do get a lot of coaches in clinics where we talk about principles. They'll tell me, I understand what you're saying, but now how do I teach that principle? Like, Brian, I know how to teach skating. I know how to teach passing, but how do I teach a principle? This becomes a solution to that. Is it, an, is it a, would you say that using an approach like the constraints led approach, and we're going to continue to dig more into this, but would you say that using such an approach makes the learning of principles more inherent? That meaning that the coach doesn't really need to worry as much about being exact or direct with the principle, that it's just going to bring principles out? I think it can with a, a certain level of subsequent knowledge, just in terms of what constraints to tweak, what task constraints and how to change okay. the environment a little bit, right? Like you look at, cross ice three on three in terms of minor hockey. I'm a very big proponent of it when it's done correctly. Um, I do think there are issues with, with the implementation of it in some cases in the sense that a lot of coaches will just say, okay, let's play for 10 minutes and just assume that their players are going to get value out of it because a, it's a smaller space and that more touches must mean more touches and, and higher frequency. What do you still think happens in, in a completely generic cross ice three on three? The best player still goes into the pile and gets the puck and spends most of the time with the puck. With the puck yeah. So, how, and to going back to your point, if we're expecting to, you know, take something like that, like cross ace three on three or something that's just more of a, a stock kind of small area game, we need to understand what things are at my disposal as a coach that I can manipulate that are going to put players into different positions to then hopefully have opportunities to enact the principle that I'm looking for. So a good example that I, I always like to use is, is something that become a little bit more popular, a little bit more catchphrasey, position before possession. You hear it talked about a lot, right? Racing for a puck is part of hockey, but racing to a certain area around the puck to then make the next play is an even higher kind of level of thinking of hockey. That's a principle. We could watch 72 different puck battles right now in that position before possession detail. Every time it's going to look, look a little different. Sometimes it's going to be a battle for the stick. A guy's going to come in and strip up with the stick. Other times they're going to shield and get their body around it. Another time they might realize that they don't really need to establish position before possession because they got there early enough. And so they forgo it and they just make the play. But as the coach, the practitioner, I need to, how can I create more instances where a player may be put into a position to have to use position before possession as a principle or as a skill. So that's where under, it's so important that, and constraints are everywhere. They are everywhere. When you drive on the road, you're driving in between constraints. One's the curb and one's the hash line on the driveway, right? Or on the road. Like you're just abiding by that because they're in your peripheral and you have an understanding of what that means for you as the driver. When you start to understand the constraints go well beyond sport, a door that pulls versus a door that pushes, that's a task constraint. How many times have you walked up just kind of early in the morning to go into a hotel and you actually accidentally pushed the door that said pull? Oh, my bad, right? Like we're just, we're not aware in that moment. So when you start to see, and the reason I want to mention that comment is it's important to start to see constraints and how they just inform you as an individual in an environment. Because when you start to see it outside of even the sport, 
I do think the support piece becomes a little bit easier. Then you just need to have an understanding of what principles am I trying to teach and then what things can I manipulate at my disposal to get them into that direction as a player. Great. I'm going to come back to talk about task versus individual versus environment constraints. Yep. So the coaches get a really good understanding of that. But you made a comment that I want to touch on before I forget about it. You just said how tasks inform us. Sorry, constraints inform us. And earlier you made the, the comment about some, something referred to as affordances. Mm -hmm. Now, Stu talked about this, Ed, Rob, they, they basically all talked about how when you start manipulating constraints, you want to manipul manipulate them in a way not so much to take things away from the athlete, but to broaden what choices they now have. And maybe they're, uh, Stu pointed this out. There, there might be times where your constraint is taking away, but while taking away, it's providing something else. So can you just go a little bit more with the affordance concept for coaches? Because I just want them to understand, again, fancy term, and we've been trying to break through all the research, scientific, fancy terms around these things in this series. But just dig in a little bit more for the coaches about what is an affordance. And when I start manipulating constraints, is there an ideal way for me as the coach to be manipulating them so that I'm not always thinking about take away, but I'm manipulating them in a way to provide opportunities or affordances that I want them to pursue without saying, now go pursue it. Yeah. I think, you know, affordance to a certain extent. So they are opportunities for action. So what am I afforded the ability to do in this moment? Um, that is ultimately influenced by a variety of factors. You have to have a certain knowledge of the game, right? Like if a player doesn't know what offsides are yet, they're not necessarily know that an affordance should be to stop at the blue line to prevent an offside from going on. So part of it's knowledge, part of it is technique in terms of the execution and how all of those different strings that we could talk about for hours coalesce is in the skill. That's the skill piece, their expression of their understanding, their knowledge, their ability, their athleticism. How does that all come together within that environment to then act, right? What are they afforded the ability to do? Um, so again, use the driving example. Another one is if you and I walk up to four or five people walk up to a large puddle, right? You're on a hike somewhere. Each of us is probably going to scan that space slightly different where, where is the optimal place for me to put my foot so that my white shoes that I just got for a hundred dollars are going to get the least amount of dirty, right? We've all puddle jump before because you didn't have a choice. The grass was muddy on the right, the roads on the left. I got to jump through this puddle because it's too long and I got to keep going where I'm going. But the affordance piece there is clearly the puddle is informing me on what I can or cannot do. And then the rest is basically what do I interpret as my ability to be able to then do so, which might be different from you or from someone else. And there's going to be similarities in there as well. But the fact of the matter is the pond or the puddle story has given me some course for action. And then I take what I know. And this is all happening at such a split second, right? When we talk about it like this, it seems like, really, you think about that when you walk up to puddles? Like, no, I promise you, I do not stand on the sidewalk and stare at puddles for 30 seconds trying to figure out how I'm going to navigate it. It happens lightning quick. But that is what's happening to us as human beings who have evolved and we're evolutionary machines. So to give it a bit more of a sport context and what I can do in hockey as a coach, I'll use the position before possession example, just since I think we've kind of defined it at least a little bit. So sometimes I'll put my kids all inside of a circle, five, six, seven, eight, even depending on size and how much space and, and what I feel is a good number. And I'll have them play a game of what I call fishbowl. So the beginning of the fishbowl is just keep the food on your stick, which is the hockey puck. They're reeling around, go, 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 go. Very, very preliminary. If I want to start to get them to understand position before possession and the idea of rounding pucks, where basically for coaches listening, they open up their feet like a Crosby turn or a 10 and two or a spread eagle, whatever turn you know it as. And they just kind of get around it a little bit to put their back towards the attacking player. So the next level I'll do in that fishbowl game is I'll say, okay, now you're not allowed to knock the player's puck away, but you're allowed while you're stick handling to try to threaten and kind of tap the other player's stick. So an offensive stick check almost. They still got to manage their puck. But when I see, you know, Billy skating by me or Susan on my right, I can try to whack at their stick really quick and just be a bit disruptive. Just be a bit disruptive. I have not told them to do position before possession at all. I can ask questions a little bit later to try to guide them where I want them to go. But what I'm hoping to see is they're going to make a few mistakes at first and they're going to start to realize, well, whatever I'm doing is not working. I keep losing my puck out of the circle and I have to go get it and that sucks. So I want to do a better job of keeping this puck on my stick. 
So what can I do? And that's where the affordance piece comes in. And that's where you're going to start to see, you know, deficiencies in skill and certain things. Cause some kids are going to start to figure out if I shield a little bit, some kids are going to surprise you and they're going to come up with a solution that you didn't even necessarily expect to have happen. And then some of them are maybe going to be a little bit more lacking. And that gives me an opportunity to then give a little bit more personalized feedback. So rather than giving everybody one singular way to do position before possession of this drill, I let them essentially play and move. Everybody's moving. Everybody's involved. Tons of opportunities for action, affordances, because I've tweaked one singular little rule that is hopefully pushing those players. If I've chosen the right constraint for the age group and the skill level, it's hopefully pushing those players into some form of what I want to see, which is position before possession. It's always going to look a little bit different. And that's where the conversations happen, which is the learning part, which is awesome. But just by tweaking one rule, hopefully they are now starting to understand, oh, I can't just leave my puck exposed. I need to now use my body, which, what is that? Well, that's position before possession, right? So that would be how I would kind of try to describe it in a fairly big nutshell. Gotcha. I like the puddle analogy. Yeah. As you're ex explaining the puddle analogy, I'm putting myself as a coach. What you're saying is as you approach the puddle, you are scanning, collecting information, and you're making a decision on how to solve that puddle problem. Correct. And if, and, and if you feel you have the skill to jump over that puddle, you're going to jump over the puddle. But if as a coach, I want you to learn how to walk around the puddle, I can now manipulate the environment and make the puddle bigger to the point where I'm not, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm taking that affordance away from you but by manipulating that or manipulating the constraint around the size of the puddle i'm now creating other things for you to find as an affordance or opportunity as you scan and take in information to solve that problem because now you look at it and go i can't jump it anymore well what can i do i can skate around the puddle yep so that's kind of that analogy is a really clear example of how a hockey player in a drill is getting information on what they can do and what they cannot do and how you as a coach now can change that information and environment to kind of sway them to do other things without ever having to tell them hey i want you to do other things yeah it it, it removes um some of the necessity and I still do think there's a time and a place for it. Again, every kid maybe learns a little bit differently. There's universal learning design and certain factors you got to maybe think about, but it removes the need, the constant need for explicit instruction, right? And that serial-based learning where it is A, then B, then C, and that I, as the coach, the moment I see a mistake, I absolutely have to pull the kid out of the drill and tell them exactly what they did wrong and exactly how they can do it right the next time, right? Because that doesn't really, at the end of the day, and, and now we're probably going to end up going into perception action coupling, it doesn't really get us to the point where they really understand what in the environment is causing them to do it so that it transfers to a game, right? Because, okay, great. I can pull them out and give them explicit instructions. Say, hey, next time a kid skates near you, I want you to turn and get your own body around and throw your, your, your bum into the guy. But then they're going to go into a game, they're going to race for a puck, and they're not going to do that because I haven't allowed them the time and the opportunity to make mistakes. I think a big piece that gets forgotten about constraint-led approach is it is good if your kids are making mistakes some of the times. Mistakes are part of learning. We've all learned from mistakes in a variety of domains. And you learn from your successes just as much as well. So it allows me to stand back and observe and take in far more rich information about my individual athletes, as well as the group as a whole, my team or whatever group I'm working with, and actually start to think more tangibly about what pointed feedback do I actually want to give that's going to provide more value. Because I can spend every ice time spending a minute pulling a kid out. No, don't do this, do that, send them back in. No, don't do this, do that, send them back in. But I can't necessarily say that they're coming away with a holistic development actually happening for them there where they understand a little bit better how to move and they understand a little bit better at what causes them to move like that in a game. What is it telling me? What is going on around me? It's telling me that I should do that. And that's obviously whatever we're working on that day. But, but I think that it's that ability to, to guide athletes and not so much put them into a box. Fabulous. Wonderful. So let's come back around now to those three types of constraints you talked okay. about. Constra constraints where the coach can manipulate things related to the task, the drill, mm -hmm. the activity. They can manipulate constraints that are related to the individual players and the environment. 
of those three, is it safe to say that task constraints are the ones that we probably have the greatest control over or ability to manipulate? I would, I would think so. And, and again, um, going back to even the, the backyard rink philosophy just for a moment, like I think a lot of a constraint-led approach, many coaches are already doing just without really a thorough awareness that they're doing it, right? Like we've all had coaches who we might consider old school or whatever, but they still award maybe a certain amount of points to a different type of outcome than another outcome right? So that a, a one timer in the slot is worth two points versus one. That's a task constraint. You're just waiting a little bit more of the outcome that you want to have happen. You never have called it a constraint led approach, but that, that is what it is now that we understand it a little bit better. Um, I do think they are absolutely the ones that we are most likely to use. I think they're probably the easiest to start using. Um, just adding in basic rules into drills a little bit more. So that cross ace three on three example earlier, one thing a coach can do if you're really not sure how to make it better, have each team decide how do they need to score a goal? So team A might decide, well, it's got to be a backhand. And then team, you know, the other team might say, well, it has to be a wraparound. Already, if the kids are at least paying attention and hear that basic instruction they've all agreed upon, they're going to have a little bit more fun. They're probably going to engage a little bit more in communication on the sideline. How can we figure this thing out? And the task is going to change for them a little bit, right? And my favorite part is without you even getting into this part, it's also probably going to change on the defensive side of the puck. Everything I've just focused on there is offensively. If team A starts wrapping the puck around a million times, well, how does team B kind of shift and, and try to defend that? Do they pick up on it? Do they become more aware of it? Is another team trying to use their backhand? How do they get defended? So by manipulating even one single task constraint, not only are you pushing you know, the athletes towards presumably the piece that you really wanted to focus them to focus on, all the other athletes that aren't maybe necessarily acting on it in that moment, but they're still involved in the game are now getting a slightly different value out of the environment, out of the game, out of the drill, whatever you want to call it. Just because now the attacking players or the defending players are shifting their thinking. Well, conversely on the other side of that, the thinking should shift as well with time. When we talk about constraints of the environment, like every time we practice, we're on a 200 by 85 foot rink and we have space in that environment to use. Is, is shrinking the space an environmental constraint or a task constraint? So when I do small space, small sided games, two on two inside a circle, one on one in a corner, three on three cross ice, um, two on two below the ringette line, Cross it. If I do any of that space manipulation, is that an environmental constraint or is that a task constraint? I would say, and this is the part of the expertise where I would say that the, the other cast members that you've had on for, for the previous episodes, I think are, are probably a little bit better to really, what's the nitty gritty final answer. I've always considered it an environmental constraint. Um, I, I do, I do think there's a world where you could probably make the argument that at the, the physical dimensions of the space maybe is a task constraint. And then the quality of the ice or the condition of the puck is maybe getting into a little bit more of a true environmental constraint. But I think as far as the athlete's concerned on the learning side of things, typically when you're changing the size of the space, you want them to become more aware of that in their environment and what that means for them. So generally, because I like to bring my athletes into this a little bit as well. I try to explain them a little bit of what I'm thinking and why I'm doing it, mostly because for so long, they've been taught the conveyor belt drill of A, B, C, back of the line, A, B, C. So when I do my stuff, they're like, what do you mean? I can just kind of do whatever I want, but I just have to follow these two rules. I'm like, well, that's exactly what I mean, but I'll explain it to you why after we do it. And I'll have a little bit more evidence to show you exactly what behaviors I was looking for. But anyways, going back to it, I do think that for, for the simplicity of it in, in our realm of acting, I do think changing the dimensions of, of the, the playing field or the surface to me, I consider it an environmental constraint because I want how they interact in their environment to change as a result of that. Fabulous, fabulous. Last piece to tell, and I know, I know you have some drill examples we're going to take a look at and, and you, yeah. you, 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 to visualize and help illustrate for the coaches how yeah. some of this can work. Last big question I have around this whole constraints-led approach, CLA, everything gets turned into an acronym in, our, yep. in the sport world, it seems. Why? That big why. We've talked a little bit about, you know, you've, you've hit on some of the benefits that come out of it. What are some of the 
what are some of the poor things we do? And that might not be the best choice of words, but what are some of the, the, the negative or less beneficial things we do coaching youth that a constraints led approach will take away from us? Like as a coach, if I, if I'm in that traditional model of serial linear a before B before C before D, you know, you got to learn to do this before you do this and so on. And if I'm very linear, if I pull my, and, and there's a lot of evidence now that suggests, and a lot of research that says that is not the greatest way for youth to learn. And, and that actually things are not learned linear. Like nobody learns in a linear manner as pure as that. So if I pull myself out of that traditional way of doing things, and I then say, I'm going to plunk myself down into that constraints-led stuff I heard Wade talk about. It sounds intriguing. I'm going to give it a go. I'm going to try it. What, what am I getting away from in that other model that now helps make me a better coach, a better teacher, a better proponent of learning, if you will? It's, no, it's a great question, I'm, and I'm happy you asked it. So I'll try to do my best. I have a million things swirling through my head. Um, at first, largely, I want to address predominantly grassroots Hockey Canada, the coaches that are driving to the rink at six in the morning in a, you know, 200 arena capacity that, you know, basically just volunteered because nobody else would. And not to say I do think, and I will talk to whatever extent we need to about on the higher end, I do still think there's as much value, but the value is a little bit different for the grassroots coaches. I think first and foremost, it absolves to a certain extent the need for absolute expertise and technical knowledge the ability to then improve hockey players, meaning you don't need to have had a killer wrist shot as a player yourself to maybe change how you're asking the player to shoot around an object you've placed on the ice or around yourself as the coach to get them to start to follow some of those principles that make constitute a good shooter. Um, so it, it absolves you from, from needing such a high level of expertise when really at the grassroots level, we just need a certain degree of consistency. Um, and more importantly, I think one of the biggest things that we're dealing with in Hockey Canada is a high level of attrition. Kids are burning out at a faster rate than ever at about the bantam age, right? U14, U15, grade eight, grade nine. Um, and part of the reason I think is combination of, you know, this new age Gen Z athlete. I was just in that high performance one seminar. Lucas Medill did a great job. I know nobody has access to that presentation, but basically boiled it down to, you know, Gen Z, Gen Z athletes and how, they deal with criticism and instruction. And, and I grew up in the model where the moment you saw a mistake on the ice, correct it. Because that was where the value was. That's what parents wanted to see in the stands. That's what they're paying for. Boom. I still do believe it to a certain extent some of the time. But the fact of the matter is, I don't need to feel that pressure to do that every single time. I can now sit back and observe a little bit more. The child, the kid, the participant is getting less criticism in their mind. I'm not saying every coach runs around and just criticizes kids. But that's kind of how they perceive it a lot of the times. They get singled out. They're the only one that gets stopped around all their peers and that detracts from the experience for them. Mental resilience and other things aside, I think that once you start to understand a constraint-led approach and shift to it, you're going to be playing things that look more like games. Not everything is a game. I still will show things that I consider to be drills, but they are gamified is another fancy term getting thrown around. Kids are going to enjoy that a little bit more. You as the coach do not need the technical knowledge. You just need a fairly strong understanding of principles which you can find a lot more detail about online. You need to have some drills and just one or two rules that you can tweak from there. And then my favorite part of it is, again, you don't spend so much of your time being overly technical and explicit. You can spend time going around and asking kids questions. And you can spend time going around and getting to know your players and doing all the other things that I think if we really agree with, constitute good coaching and making memorable experiences. You're not so overwhelmed that I need to run this airtight 10 minute drill, 10 minute drill and, and, and such a buttoned up practice plan that looks so good and appealing to, uh, to, to parents or coaches or administrators or stakeholders. I can be a little bit messier. I can be okay with a 10 minute drill actually stretching out to 12 to 13 to 14 to 15 because I saw some growth within it or I saw some deficiencies that continued and needed to be, you know, played with a little bit. And I, I can absolve myself to a certain degree of some of the unnecessary pressures that come with grassroots coaching. Beyond just the benefits that I think you've done a great job highlighting, those are, the, I think, the hidden things that I've only come to realize since doing it myself. Like, not that I don't care what our stakeholders and people watching my sessions think of me, but I'm a little bit more confident now, just like, no, like I understand and see the value in this and I can explain to you in great detail where I see that value, but I'm not letting my shoulders 
start to get above my ears on the ice because I'm so stressed out about does this look good? Is every kid being talked to all the time? Have we gotten enough reps in our linear drills all the time? And my shoulders have gone down and I enjoy the interactions of the players a little bit more. So that would be my, you know, that would be my sales pitch as to, to what it can do for you beyond just the true player development aspect. So chaos is okay, is what you're saying. Yes, it's chaos. Watch hockey. Go watch NHL anywhere. Yeah. It's all chaos. Chaos is good. I love your comment about, you know, it takes the burden off the coach having to be such a technician. I actually had a, a it, you walked right into it. I have a quote written here, and for the life of me, I cannot remember where I got it. But I was reading a, something about constraints that approach to coaching. And the the, the, the quote basically says the following. Under the CLA, the coach no longer needs to be the tactician or technician of yesteryear. They now become the architect of the environment. And I thought, wow, that, that's a very fancy sounding thing. But that's kind of what you just encapsulated is that in this approach, if you are a technician or a tactician, like you're the X and O guys, you played the game, you're a high performance coach, you know it inside and out, it fits you, it suits you. If you're a mom or dad volunteering that doesn't have that background, it fits you, it suits you. It, it, it applies everywhere and, and every level and age to every coach that's working in this game. Absolutely. And you're presumably going to go less wrong than if you actually prescribe poor instruction or you deliver your messages wrong and you mislead a player, right? Like you, players will still fall into their certain patterns of behavior if you're not really tweaking a lot of tasks or environments and whatnot, but they're still at least in terms of volume being exposed to a variety of environments, situations, elements that constitute the actual game of hockey, right? Um, and I, we've done wave skating up and down goal line to goal line forever here. Like I'm not saying that I don't do some of the things that I in this call, maybe I'm suggesting that you don't do. I just think that if it can become the predominant tool in your toolbox at a grassroots level, it can make things so much easier for you, not because you're doing less work, but you're removing yourself at a certain point from a lot of the work, which is just making sure the drill looks pretty. And then you get to do the meaningful work, which is coaching and actually having conversations and trying to guide the players towards the things. So you can still go over and say, hey, like, you know, if a kid's holding their stick like this, like, I'm okay with explicit instruction. It's not like you necessarily always need to have a task on hand where it's like, oh, have to have your hands two feet apart on your hockey stick. Like, no, it doesn't always need to be that rigid in terms of how you're operating. But if you set up a game that has to do with puck handling protection and puck skills, you're going to see every single kid doing this within two to three seconds of the game playing. And then you can start to go in and give a little bit more of your traditional explicit feedback if that's still your comfort zone. But it, it just, it gives you uh, a lot more space to actually be a coach rather than to be, you know, I, I use the word drill sergeant. Like if you're out there just running drills and whistles in your mouth the whole time, you're just a drill sergeant. Like you're there. It's, it's based in the army to begin with. That's why we call them drills. Right. So yeah. what's the difference, right? In the end. So to me, yeah, it just, it frees you up to actually be a coach and to make meaningful experiences for kids at the grassroots level, which is what we need if we want kids to continue playing to become NHL players or whatever we want them to become. Right. Like we, it starts with the joy of the game, which I think playing more games, feeling like you're in the game a little bit more, interacting with your peers, a little less time at the board and a little less coach stopping and starting and stopping and starting. I can't see how that doesn't benefit the players in the long run either. Now we're going to jump. We're going to get you to share your screen here uh, in in yep. just a second, Wade. Because we're going to you're going to walk us through some of these real neat, and I'm going to call them drills. Yeah, that's fine. Because because I think it's I think it's important for coaches who are listening to this episode and the previous episodes. I don't want them to get caught up in thinking that the constraints led approach is just a fancy way of saying, oh, you need to play more games. Yeah. more small area games, more cross ice. Huh? That's not what we're saying. You know, and I love the comment you made earlier about gamifying a drill. This is an approach that you can have drills, you can have games, small space games, larger space games, low organized games. This is an approach that covers the whole scope and realm of what we can potentially do or have been doing on the ice with athletes. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think, and I'm a big believer. I want to say it was, was it Stu that you had on first? Yeah. Stu 
Um, he, he made a point of talking about at the end of the day, like what he, I thought, I felt boiled it down to really brilliantly, um, to a certain extent was just, is your intention sound? Like, is your intent to produce a certain outcome? If you're, if you're leading with intent and, and, and you have your core philosophies, then I think you're, you're heading in a better track than somebody who isn't. Um, so there is a time and a place probably for a linear drill that we could, we could probably discuss, but yeah, for me, I, whether you call them drills, environments, whatever, to me, it doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, it's, it's just about putting them in situations that, that occur in games, right? And that's my intention. Some of them will look more like traditional drills with a kind of a beginning and an end with a little more flexibility in there, a little bit more task and environmental constraints. Some of them will look like lower organized games. And then don't know how many I have, maybe a few you'd consider a small sided game or small area game, but I'm just looking at my other screen here for anybody watching where the drills are. But, but yeah, I, I just think it's about, you have the right intention first and then I build backwards from there. My intent is, okay, I want them to get better at this. And then I build everything else the other way. I, the first thing I was told in my master's when I started was begin with the end in mind. And it's been a saying that I have, you know, followed in every facet of my life beyond just coaching, but, but I found it incredibly valuable in this space. Yeah. Fabulous. Okay. Let's, uh, okay. let's take a look at some of the uh, interesting things you have. Yeah. And I'll just confirm with you. You can see that. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So yeah, so we'll just go through a, a couple different, again, drills uh, and, and things like that. And I'll kind of just guide you through. I left the sheet fairly bare bones for you, the viewer, just because I didn't want it, everything to be over cumbersome for, for the viewer. Um, but this is a game called Puck Tag. And it's actually something I took from a phys ed activity that was originally called Chicken Tag. And the premise of the, the game is if anybody here has ever watched the show Survivor, the puck operates like the immunity idol, meaning if you have the hockey puck, you cannot get tagged. So it kind of flipped traditional game on its head where we spend a lot of the time teaching players how to get open to acquire a puck um, and, or having the puck means you're under attack, where in this case, not having the puck means you're under attack. So some of the principles that it gets you thinking about is players are afforded the ability to get open. They have to understand that I need to get away from a check to begin with, and I need to find open ice space so that I can acquire the puck. Naturally, they do not want to get tagged. I do not need to tell them to communicate. They're going to figure out pretty quickly. They need to hoot and holler for a hockey puck from somebody that has it so that they can get it. So essentially what you're seeing on the screen here, you can scale the numbers depending on how many you have in the space. Uh, I've cut it to just a quarter of his own here or half of his own, sorry. And I have about uh, six players right now who are non-players that are not it. So they're the participants. And then I have two players here just designated them as defense. They would actually be it. Typically with younger players, I think it's a little bit easier and more fun if they don't have their sticks in their hands. And also I don't have to worry about jersey colors, so it actually signifies to those players that they are the ones who are it. Um, and so basically what happens is you'll start, you'll say, go, you can have players start in certain positions if you'd like, or you have them all kind of sprint to the zone, but the players work together to try to distribute the puck to present, prevent any player from getting tagged. So if I have the puck, I can't get tagged. So now I've got a sprint. Maybe this forward kind of comes down here because they need a puck because they're coming and chasing them around. So you're managing quite a few different things. You're managing who is my check, right? You don't have to tell them that they have a check on them. But at some point, a player that doesn't have a puck is going to start being chased by a player with, who is it, or at one of the red jerseys. And then at that point, they're going to need to fall for a pass. They're going to need to present a target in order to acquire the puck. And then once they get it, position before possession, probably. And then they're going to need to do what? Well, they're going to need to look and find the next teammate who's now calling for a puck, who is now available to be tagged. So this is a puck tag game. We, uh, I use it to warm up quite a bit just to get the players engaged, get them moving, get them communicating quite a bit. A um, couple different ways you can do it where – if a player does get tagged, they just immediately swap sticks. If you kind of have all lefties or it works out that well, um, a lot of the times what I'll do is I'll do a points based system. So I'll just say, Hey, honor scouts, honor system. How many times you get tagged, come back with that number. Okay. And then lowest number, you know, gets a little bit of a, a little bit of a cheer or, or whatever, just in that way, you don't have to worry about the chaos of the players chasing constantly switching, but that is something that you can scale depending on abilities and how hard you want them thinking about their role within the game. So, so, yeah, so if you we, want to dive in any time. If, if, let's go back to that diagram. Yeah. So I'm playing this game as a coach, and, and I've, you know, I've explained it to the players, and I think they understand it. Um, the players, the two, the two players in red are basically pl playing chase. They're trying to tag yep. anyone who doesn't have a puck. Yep. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping that my explanation of the game has told the offensive team that the only way for you to avoid being tagged is to get away from them, find open space, call for a pass, get the puck given to you quickly so that the person chasing you can't tag you. And I'm hoping that the person with the puck understands my role now 
is to get it to my teammates quickly so I can help them not be tagged. What do I do as a coach when I start to see that the passes don't come quick enough, the taggers are too fast, they're getting everybody tagged too quickly? Give the coaches an idea of, from a constraint perspective, how do I change this drill so that I don't have to take them out and say, okay, let's go work on our passing. It's terrible. Or let's go into this drill where we work on finding space. I've got the drill. I just need to change it to get the learning. What do I do? Great question. I think the first two at your disposal as a coach, especially somebody just starting to explore these things, is space and numbers. Um, numbers of how many players have a puck, um, number of how many pucks you have out there, um, number of players that are chasing, and then the size of the space. Um, so generally, in, in something like this, especially to your point where puck movement is, is involved, right, there is a large, typically a large gap in those skills. So you're probably going to want to add a couple more pucks if the players are a little weaker and a little slower to move the puck so that the amount that have them is a little bit higher and the amount that don't is a little bit lower. And then you're probably going to want to open this space a little bit. And the only reason I say a little bit is the bigger the space gets, the larger the puck movement gets, which could also be challenging for a puck. So you got to kind of find that right marriage between the two. And this is my favorite part. You know, when we talk about kids, what do they want when they're playing in practice? They just want things to be a little bit different each and every time. So I can bring them back in. I can ask them one question like, hey, what can I do as the player without the puck to get a puck, right? Somebody's chasing me. I need a puck. What can I do? And I, while I'm asking questions, you, Brian, my partner, my, 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 my assistant coach, I've just told you right before, hey, can you push those mats, those dividers out just an extra foot beyond the hash mark, right? So you're doing that. Kids go back. The game changed a little bit. Feels a little bit better for them, right? The, the scale of the difficulty probably fits them a little bit better. They're re-engaged. They have one little cue now to maybe think about. And then I'm back to observing and just kind of monitoring where are things at. I've talked to them for maybe 30 to 45 seconds, and they're already right back in the activity. They're moving again. Their heart's beating. They're sweating, right? All these other benefits that we wanted of coaching. So I would always start with space first, um, dependent on skillability. And then from there, depending on the drill, you're not always going to be able to throw in three pucks. Not every drill or situation requires that. But I would say numbers, numbers being the amount of attackers or defenders or the amount of objects or whatever you have in there to, to manipulate. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So moving on, this one is a little bit, I would say, I, I call it the breakfast special because I usually drop it on players early in the morning when I want them to wake up and get them thinking. I try to catch them a little bit off guard, but it kind of builds upon the last one in terms of getting open. It, it gets them now to build in a little bit more, I think, scanning. You can start to talk a little bit more about awareness and being aware of maybe where your next play may or may not be. So often what I'll do, it's not drawn up here, but I'll get them all lined up on a line. So we have five players uh, in this diagram here. We have four blue, okay, with a, a green forward. So they're together. So any of the forwards are grouped together as a team. And then we have five D, four technically playing, um, and then with a fifth out here as well. So basically these are two teams operating in the same space. Uh, doing the exact same thing, which is basically player one. So I line them all up on the line, team one here, team two here on the blue line, and I line them all up and I basically say, okay, player one, you're passing to player two on your left. They're passing to player three on their left, four, okay, and then four goes all the way back to one. The fifth player is just a disruptor. So what's going on in this space is there's two teams of four, essentially, that are basically trying to move their puck in a predetermined order amongst themselves. One to two, two to three, three to four, four back to one. That is one point. If you get all the way back to the original player without being disrupted, you have a fifth player on your team who is not involved in the passing. Their sole job is just to try to disrupt the other team. Because if you've ever worked with four-year-olds, five-year-olds, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, they actually figure out the solution pretty quick. If I put two teams in there without any disruption, they're going to make a little square in one corner and a little square in the one other corner, and they're going to pass the puck around and try to get as many points as they can because, well, that's the way the game works. So that's where I've added a bit more of uh, manipulation because a lot of times they'll say everybody just move around move around and again what do they care about well they care about scoring the points so they will find a way to do that more efficiently but it doesn't necessarily get them doing what i want which is scanning and being aware of if i know that brian is my number one on my left and i know that i'm passing um to jill on my right i need to be aware of where those players are that's what i want them to experience so by adding the two disruptive players on both sides now everybody has to move at some point because they're being shepherded around by that player. They're also interacting amongst nine other bodies. What does that sound like? Well, hockey, there's nine other players on the ice at the same time for the most part. And they're working on still their passing skills, getting open, puck acquisition, all those other little principles. And then from there, again, it's just what do I want to really coach out of this drill? For me, I usually use this for scanning piece to start a practice. 
Um, but you, again, once you start to look at the constraint piece, the opportunities for where you can lead this are, are, are not endless, but I think are, are a lot more bountiful than most drills typically tend to be, right? So the disruptor player, mm -hmm. so you've got the four players in black jerseys, you've got four yep. players in blue jerseys, Yep. and there's a green jersey player who's on the blue team, but not involved in passing. Her job is to steal the puck from the blacks, like to get the puck, break up the passes, just be a defensive nightmare, correct? Great question. Great question. You can scale it, right? Sometimes I'll just say just be a complete pain in the in the bleep, right? Where I really want you to hound the puck, but I don't want you to go so as far to poke it or dislodge it. I just want you to really make sure that that player that has it feels under pressure. Again, that's me scaling the task constraint because I might have a group of players intermingled where there's a few that are quite adept at moving the puck around for their age group or wherever they're out with. And then I might have a few that are, are a little bit weaker. So I can still put that weak player in a position where they're getting representative design in terms of they're under the gun, they're under pressure they don't maybe even necessarily realize that they're actually being allowed to maybe give a pass, but they are, they have a little bit more time and a space afforded to them so they can acclimatize to the drill, to the environment. And then from there, okay, now you're allowed to steal the puck. And guess what? If you steal the puck, maybe you get a point back. If you can give it back out to me, you get two points and I'll give it back to the other team and it'll repeat from there. But to your point, again, going back to constraint led approach, I'm not bound by the drill here. That is something that I have at my disposal to now tweak or change based on what I'm trying to get the players to take away from the drill or come out of it with. Gotcha. Interesting point here. Um, and I, I just, I just want to, I want to throw this out to the coaches that are listening, because when I look at this, two things you've talked about jump out at me. And one thing that I said, number one, I think most coaches would look at this and they would call this a small area game, which is fine. It's an activity, it's just a game. But a couple of the points that you've made, I think, are very important for coaches to, to think about. What is your intent? So you are very specific. When you play this game, when you run this drill, when you do this activity, you have an intention. It's not just to play a game. There is an intention. And as the coach, you are assessing and evaluating the activity by the intention. And when the intention is not being met, the outcome is not, you don't break it apart and stop playing the game. You manipulate it, adjust constraints, task numbers, rules, so that your intention never changes, but the environment, the rule, that those things might change, but the intention doesn't go away. And it's essentially, it stays the same activity. Yeah, because I think, and again, this is where I talked earlier, it absolves you maybe from technical knowledge, but it also absolves you from pulling your hair out and chasing around 32 different mistakes that occur within a minute and a half of a drill. Like you're going to see kids bobble pucks in there. You're going to see a kid maybe not have their stick on the ice for two or three seconds. And yeah, there's the odd thing you can still shout out because of habits and, and certain things you are trying to reinforce. I'm not saying you put duct tape on your mouth and you just don't say anything until one thing happens. But in general, if I've planned my ice time the way that I want it to kind of transpire and I have what I'm looking for that day, is I'm trying to get the players to get the value out of that practice plan that I can get in that 50 minutes to an hour and 20, an hour and a half, right? I can't teach them every single little thing in that ice time, nor is it probably beneficial for me to teach them, you know, let's say six to seven things or little things across the course of the session, rather than one to two big ticket items across the whole session that look a little bit different and scale across the ice time, right? Like I, I have my my core focus is for that plan. And I want to adhere to them within reason. Yes. Something egregious is going to take my attention at some point, but I can't let every single little talking point draw me away from what do I want them to come away from when they're doing this exercise. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Um, I mean, I, I got a few more if you want to keep going, but it's totally up to you. We've, we've got some time for sure. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Love it. Um, so Building upon that, by the, okay. By the way, by the way, I can't pull my hair out. So yeah, I, 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 I wonder. I'm like, oh, I don't know, no. but uh, but yeah, I just. I don't know if that, that was. I don't know if that was a chirp or not. But. No, 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 no. We don't do that here. No, we don't do that here. Um, but uh, yeah, I just think that it it just really saves you the trouble of having to worry about about every little nitty gritty detail and just focusing on on those principles, right? But so this one here, it actually. So when I I mentioned TGFU and, and running into that in my Bachelor of Education program. 
So when I started doing a teaching placement, I was tasked with a um, Invasion Games unit. And that was the first time I remember being taught Invasion Games in high school myself, but I don't really remember them being taught like as a certain branch of game, as a certain branch of competition for whatever reason. I just knew basketball is basketball, soccer, and so on. I didn't, I didn't at that time really appreciate or understand the complexity of each sport and, and the similarities and differences within them. So I actually ended up having to teach a bit of a basketball unit. And one of the, the TGFU games that I found um, was a game called Four Corners. And it was great because what it does essentially is you basically play 3v3 in a core space at the center of a drill. So in this case, it's red versus black, 3v3 inside of here. Um, and, and there's a bunch of different variations you can do. But the initial one is in basketball, you make no, you can only do bounce passes. So again, there's a constraint just trying to get them to learn a basic skill. Um, but the nice part about this is it, it's pretty straightforward in terms of three and three hockey is fairly easy to figure out for the most part, especially the smaller you make the space. You're just, if, if I've got Brian, you've got them and you've got them. So the defensive side, so it's really small area. And, and what you add is you add passing constraints. So the way that it starts out in the beginning is you have two players that are your goals. So they're on opposite sides of here and then opposite sides here for black. And basically you give a task constraint of, you have to make two, three, four, five consecutive passes. And at that moment that you have, you have permission to try to pass to one of your two goal players. You can make them pass to one goal player and then they actually have to work their way over the other if you'd like. But the purpose of this is it builds them up in a few different ways. One, it gets them to understand um, having to get open here. You're not going to get any sort of sequential passing if you don't continue to get open and communicate like we've talked about. But what you build it up into eventually is you actually remove the players from the corners. And then it starts to become about a really important idea in hockey, which is the timing and the ability to present in the good ice at the right time. We all talk about timing, and then we all have a vague understanding of what it is. But what does it exist like in your head? Right? Like, how do you teach timing as a skill? Well, you, 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 you don't really, at least in the traditional method that we do, you can't teach timing in a serial-based manner because it doesn't happen serially in the game. Yes, there are certain circumstances and and, and coincidences that maybe lend you to think, oh, the puck's about to come to the high slot or it's about to come to the half wall. But every time it's a little bit different. So players, Matthew Kachuk is the absolute best player in the game right now away from the hockey puck, right? Like when I watch him play. So by removing the players from the corners, going back to the drill is now a player has the opportunity after two, three, however many consecutive passes, one of them has to decide when and which space to pop into to then get the next pass or another pass eventually to receive it. So what do you typically, and again, this is where teaching games for understanding constraint led approach comes in. What do you think usually happens with the younger players? The moment they get to their consecutive pass number of two or three, a kid sprints to that space and just stands there and waits and waits and waits. And now they're playing a three on two in that small area. And what do you think happens? Well, they lose the puck and they got to start all over again because the player hasn't necessarily considered yet that when they move to that space, is just as important as whether they move to that space at all. And that is a very hard conversation to have with a player if you do not create some sort of environment that allows you to have that conversation with them. I can show a million video clips and be like, well, why didn't you go to the ice here at that time? That doesn't do anything for them. But can I teach them the elements of timing and some th certain things to perceive in here? So for example, expectation, anticipation. If you're at pass number two and you're the furthest away from the puck, you're probably not going to get pass number three. Can you anticipate that you're probably actually going to be on the receiving end of pass number four, which might be the scoring pass. So now you're having conversations about, again, principles, anticipation, opening up to space at the right time, timing in general. If that makes sense, hopefully I've done a good job articulating that. Fabulous. Fabulous. I, yeah. I, 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 I would like to be able to go on the ice tomorrow and play this game and see, and see, see how it works. It's yeah. I'm very, it's intriguing. Yeah. And it just, it, and then it's still hockey. You're still playing three and three keep away. You still have your stick skills. All those things are still going on and they're still getting enriching value out of it. My intent, my focus just happens to be that day about the presentation of space, the timing of it, the anticipation of it, right? Some of those things that are actually, I think, much harder to talk about with players in a, in a, especially a practice setting. Um, so I'll keep moving here so we can expand on that idea. And now you start to gamify it a little bit more specifically in like, okay, this starts to look and feel a little bit more like the sport of hockey. You're never really playing 3v3 keep away in the center ice circle, right? You shouldn't be. That's a weird game if that happens. But now we're, we're starting to get in the corner. The net front's there. Um, so I just call this 3v3 plus one pop into space. So basically it's three on three in the corner, small area game. Again, you can half the ice here if you'd like to. 
Um, I've highlighted some areas in the ice that I will typically try to highlight with like a bingo dabber or a marker or something on the ice to indicate it for them. Cause I do think it's important when possible um, to make players aware of key areas on the ice and getting them aware of where they are in the rink. I think it's an important factor that again, a constraint led approach lends itself to a lot more, right? Yes. We start drills at the hash mark and things like that, but do we actually put value on the dot? Do we always put value on the slot in an appropriate way in drills? Not always. So I have a little bit of a ramp line here. So basically the team that's in possession of the puck gets the plus one. So if black were to turn it over to blue right here, right away, black would just step back onto the blue line. Blue would then join and they have to stay above the ring at line. They're basically just a bit of a relief valve, at least initially. So then it's just three on three. And all we're trying to do is we're trying to get a touch for one point at the dot. So a principal in hockey's dot support, right? You usually have one to two in the pile and you usually want that third player thinking about, okay, where's the valuable ice? Where do I get open? How do I time that building upon that last drill? So all I'm looking for here is just, can we start making some attempts to that dot area? And then maybe you add in a second space, like the high slot now is worth two points. You, you prioritize obviously getting it to that prime area of the rank a little bit more. Um, and then a third progression you can do, if you're not always already playing full rank, you can expand it to the full end. But a third and final progression that I'll often do to build in that anticipation, that reading piece is that plus one player is allowed to dive down below the ringette line in anticipation of a pass. And they can only stay in the event that they receive the puck and they have to make a play with the puck, whether it's a shot, whether it's another pass, but they have to make a play. Presumably they're going to shoot just because of the area of the rink we're putting them in here. And maybe they make a one touch pass because we're putting them here. I don't tell them what to do. I just tell them they got to make a play. If they don't get a pass, they got to circle back out. If their team's still in possession, they reclaim the space. If their team's lost possession at this point, presumably because maybe the player forced a pass through a stick, or made a bad read, now they just loop over to the blue line and the blue players occupy their space until there's another change of possession. But you can start to hopefully see um, that there's been a slow progression of a lot of these principles, right? Like in the beginning, it's just about getting open and communicating on the puck. Then we start to get in the next game, drill, whatever you want to call it, a little bit more scanning involved, a little bit more anticipatory skills. And then the last game, the four corner one's a lot more about timing. Am I popping a space at the right time? Am I playing off the puck well? And now here it's, you know, it's a little more hockey. This is the cycle. This is, you know, a high F3. This is all the more systematic oriented play that you as a coach would talk about. And you can still shape the game around. For me, this is how I've typically done it. But again, you can tweak it however you'd like. You can put those gray areas in different spots of the rink that maybe you prioritize. Maybe you want to behind the net, going back to Matthew Kachuk, he's brought back Gretzky's office this playoffs right? Maybe you want to start prioritizing how to use behind the net play a little bit more as a team. But to me, like the world really is your oyster when you strip back that a drill has to go an absolute perfect way. And you just have core themes that you're trying to develop within that drill. So in, in this drill, what are some of, what are some of the issues I'll, I'll say, or errors? What are some of the things when you've played this, you've run into, but then you've had to manipulate a constraint to, to change the activity, to kind of rejig it and rewire it for your intention. For sure. Um, so I think a good one um, that typically occurs is you'll have players forcing passes. So one of, the, one, of the, one of the rules that I'll often add in is that you have to make a, you can only make passes off cutbacks. And now that seems like really restrictive and it is in a certain way. They're probably going to end up making more cutbacks than I would like them to make in terms of the bigger picture of hockey. But what it ultimately does is it allows me to now start to talk to the players away from the puck of the moment a player makes a cutback, what have they hopefully created time and space? What are they going to be looking to do with that time and space? Well, they're going to be looking to make a play because typically what happens here before I've added that constraint is players just force pucks. They understand where the areas the ice that they need to get the puck to and they just try to shove puck there because that's again what the game is telling them to do. And so twofold, you have the player on the puck that isn't as patient as they probably could be. They might have a little more time to add one more cutback or evasive maneuver to create a bit more time and space. And then you have the players off the puck to get a little bit more standing still oriented and aren't necessarily reading, okay, when am I best to move? Because that's most supportive to my teammate, which often is actually out of a cutback, right? For, within reason. So just by adding that rule now, you can only pass after you've cut back. Okay. So if you, there's no pass out of a cutback, you got to find some new ice and then eventually you're going to add another cutback. So it ends up leading probably into less, typically into less actual occurrences of what I'm looking for, but the occurrences that do happen, which are hard to earn in 3v3 in that corner. That's the hardest part of the game is getting the puck from the sure. perimeter to, to prime time ice. But the ones that do start to occur 
are a lot more representative of what I want to see into the game. And I've also built in a little bit more information for them. So now we've talked about timing and before it was just a based about the sequence of passing with the puck. Now it's a based on my teammate cutting back. So when we talk about perce- perception action coupling, again, this is all happening rapidly, but if I can educate a player to understand that, okay, if a player cuts back, they're going to be looking for a support spot. Well, that's when you got to move to that support spot, or at least that's when you should be thinking about it and letting the game obviously still tell you where that ice actually is, is important. But now we can start to have that level of conversation with the player and it doesn't seem overly cumbersome to them. I don't think most of the time. Fabulous. Fabulous. And again, what, before we have yep. to end, end off yep. here, I want to talk to you uh, because this has been sensational. Like this, this has just been really good. I want to, I want to throw out the topic of, of flow drills. Okay. Um, the use, the use of flow drills in practices, um, very, very much in coupled with the traditional model of how you know how we practice, and you know we go on the ice, we warm up, we run through a bunch of flow drills, and then we get into our tactical stuff. We finish with a game, and there, yeah, practice is over. Right. I'm just going to let you speak to the value of what we call flow drills from a skill development perspective. Should we be using them? Do we overuse them? Do they fit this constraints-led approach, this representative, nonlinear approaches that we've been talking about? Like, in, in, in all of this stuff, are we saying flow drills have to go? Or are we saying we need to minimize them or are we saying we just need to look at the ones we're using and make sure that they represent the game better and that our intention is 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 clear with why we're using it? That's Absolutely. a lot to unpack here. I know. I, I know I've said a lot, so I'm going to just let you go. No, it's a great question. And I, I really do think, to me, you start to hit the nail on the head where I think we can add more value to them. I'm a big, like, I don't know what the saying actually is. I think it's like something like never say never and never say always. And that's something I am a big believer in. Like, I do not want coaches to just go throw their complete drill book out, right? And maybe you're going to use it a little bit less or you really need to go back to the drawing board with it. In terms of their value, I would say that I, I find myself questioning them, especially traditional ones, like your J drill and like your, your two on O's, three on O's. But I, I know you had a great conversation with um, some of the other, the other um, members that have done this about, you know, patterning and routes on the ice and getting them to think about um, kind of your structure and your shape. Like, I do think there's value. Like, if you want to talk about how to move in a three-on-two scenario, yeah, there's probably a little bit of value letting them go in three-on-zero and thinking a little bit about their spacing just so that they have a little bit of that. But again, for me, that's built into a practice plan where that is very much like a feel-oriented thing. I'm just trying to get them kind of honed in on that aspect. And then as we build it up with more of a constraint-led approach, then I'm testing to see whether, okay, I gave you a chance to feel it and kind of sort it out as a line, let's say. Then I maybe put you into a smaller kind of drill, which I, can, I even actually happen to have one that's kind of a little bit rush oriented. And then now we're in a little bit more of a traditional three on two rush based drill. And I want to see, are you achieving depth? Are you, you know, driving the defender back and slashing their stick like Radko Gudis did against the Leafs there, right? Like, are you doing those little things that maybe we've built in when we've done some kind of more flow type drills? I do think they probably, again, in minor hockey, they, they afford a coach to maybe get a few more touches than they might otherwise, right? Like I, I think especially for coaches that are starting to adopt this approach, yeah, have one constraint-led oriented drill in the middle of practice and do your flow ones on the ends of it that tie into that drill, right? But don't put the burden on yourself to completely flip your playbook, but, but use them as more of a complementary piece. I don't think that they necessarily really, from a translating aspect, I do not see the more I dive into constraint-led approach how they are conducive to transferring what they think they're transferring to a game environment for the most part. And if they are, they're transferring bad things, right? Like I deal with players at a junior to aspiring professional level that still skate to that hash marks and shoot with their head down. Why? Well, 90% of flow drills end with you getting free reign to the house and just going in and ripping it forever. And all what do kids care about? Scoring a goal. They don't necessarily try to score goals in ways that are scored in a game. As long as they score in practice and they get it by the goalie's blocker because they shot from five feet away, they're happy. They feel good about themselves in the corner, but 
but that's actually reinforcing something that is a skill that's going to be much harder for them to change at a higher level, shooting with their eyes up, adding in deception, et cetera, et cetera. So that's my biggest gripe with flow drills. And you touched on it as well. And the last thing I'll end with, I think so much can be done if you can get your staff more involved. My biggest, not gripe, because I don't think it's fair when, when, when coaches are volunteers to necessarily like they've had a long day and certain things and they show up to the rink and get them buzzing around the round, like around the rink, like I do with a bunch of energy because, well, it's my job and I'm getting paid to do it. I don't think it's fair to equate what I try to do to grassroots coaches, but there are coaches that lean on the boards and sip their Timmy's coffee, right. In a pair of jeans. And they just kind of don't really do anything to help practice. They just kind of move the odd puck and that's about it. And that's great. If, but if you're mobile enough, go stand in a kid's way. If you're mobile enough, you know, and a kid's doing a traditional breakout drill where they get a pass on the hash marks and they're starting to skate all the way down the ice one on all. Just go stand at the blue line like a different fin way. Don't step up, up on them. Don't say boo. Just see if they look. Even just adding that, even though the drill isn't maybe a constraint led oriented drill, that little microcosm, that slice that Stu said, which I love. I know you said you're going to feel it. I'm going to feel it. But that slice of the drill itself, the drill's already supposed to be a slice, but now that slice of the drill is at least a little bit more valuable to that player because they're going to run into it two or three times. And then hopefully that kid gets to the front of the line again, looks over their shoulder, says, oh, there's a coach in the way. Now, when I get that pass, I got to see where that coach is and not run into them. Just by standing. Like, if you want to lean on the board, great. But lean on the board where you're actually in the way. A lot of times coaches try to get out of the way. Like, strategically place yourself in the way of traditional flow drills. And even that is at least building in something that will hopefully translate and should translate more likely than getting a free wheel down the wing for a shot from the hash marks with no contestion. Great info. Love that answer. It, I raised it because, because I was intrigued with a comment that Ted made yesterday when I made, made the distinct, distinction of skills practice from team practice. And he was very quick to, to, to say to me, why do we need both? Like, shouldn't every practice be a skills practice? And I think sometimes that coaches look at flow drills as their skill section in their practice. So that's where I work on skills in the flow, the flow drills, the, the Canada cup drill and, and the J drill and these, yep. the, you know, the, these, these two on O. And I, I just, I don't believe that that's the most effective approach to, to skill acquisition and development. But when you start then constraining them, when you start adding elements and intentions into those where players now have to scan and look and make a decision, now they become much more skill oriented rather than, as you say, where I just get free reign. Make them a little bit more like Stu's slice of the game, right? But it was really interesting when he, he said that yesterday in, in, in the episode where, you know, why, why do we do both? Why, why, why in youth hockey is certain practice a skills day, but then the other practice is the team day? Why can't it all be? skills practice why can't everything we're doing and i and what what i've taken away from listening to you five experts talk about this the one thing that's going to stick with me is i now more than ever believe that every activity we run in a practice every single one if we run it the right way will develop the individual skills of players and we do not need to distinguish. This is a skill drill. This is a tactic drill. This is a skill day. This is a team day. Everything we do should be contributing to the individual skill development of the players that are on the ice. And it can inside these theories and frameworks and approaches, working nonlinear, looking at the environment, using constraints, being representative. All of that comes together, I think, to serve our players much, much better than the traditional model that we, we, for many years, I used until I started getting away from it and most coaches use. So, Absolutely. And again, that's still only just considering the development piece, which is incredibly important. That's why we're here, right? We're trying to develop better and smarter and more skillful hockey players, which is the expression of so many things within them uh, beyond just technique. Um, but then there's still just, it's probably going to be more fun for the kids probably going to retain more players across our ranks probably a little bit a little bit of growing pain for for coaches at first to take on take it on in terms of maybe challenging themselves for for personal growth and trying to find kind of the balance that works for them 
But in the end, I think it'll make their time as a coach presumably more enjoyable. The biggest thing is always going to be buy-in, um, you know, is getting the buy-in from the parents and making sure that they're at the very least understanding that you're trying a little bit of, in today's world, what is considered a new or novel approach, even though a lot of this research, it dates back to like the 80s, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so it's, it's, it's not, it, it's, we're not reinventing the wheel here. I do think we're trying to understand how the wheel works a little bit better. And in some ways that we've always been doing, but just not nearly as pointedly as we probably could for the benefit of the player. Great. Wade, um, where can coaches connect with you? Social media, internet, if they want to, you know, if they want to follow your wisdom, I know you're doing, you shared with me, you're doing some work with Greg Rivek, I believe on, on, yes, on I've been hockey Arsenal site. So if, if he ends up listening, I've been kicking the can a little bit down the road. So I, this has actually been a really good Kickstarter because all those drills that I finally kind of put pen to paper with, what I'm hoping to do is to release uh, a very hopefully approachable series, a little bit less language based with respect to what you've covered. I would probably, I'm probably going to tee this up to be a great, you know, five part resource in terms of you really want to dive head first into this stuff a little bit more on the hockey oriented side, kind of what we got into with the drills today of just about yeah. using constraint led drills to teach 10 core principles in the sport of hockey. Um, each with, I don't know exactly how many numbers I'm going to do in terms of, but I want to have at least one kind of constraint or manipulation to scale it up for more skillful players where it's kind of already in a neutral medium ground and then maybe one kind of regressive or regression, whatever you want to call it to scale it back down for a little bit easier players. And it won't just be always as simple as, Oh, expand the space or change the numbers. We'll try to go into some detail like I did, but yeah, I want to write a 10 part series for him. So I'll, that'll be on my Twitter. The only place to really try to find me where I I'll, I'll get back to you fairly quick is at Wade underscore Russell. Russell has two S's, two L's. So you can hopefully see it. I think in my zoom screen here, um, just spelling like that, there's just an underscore in between for the at. So, um, but yeah, and, and I just want to thank you. Like I really, in my master's, the biggest thing that out of all of this that I really came away with was the need for coach mentorship and coach development and coach education in North America in particular and in, 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 in hockey here in Canada. So I just want to thank you on behalf of all your listeners because I'm not sure how many are reaching out for what you're doing for the sport and the landscape here because as we've chatted about, like it is so important. And then this is not a conversation that, is ending like research in particular in this area. Like it's always, it's just an ongoing conversation. We're going to find some other little subsection of this that we could probably do a little bit better in some years to come. This is not us thumbing our, you know, our nose at people and saying, ah, we'd have the right way. We're just trying to help people do things. They're probably already doing to a certain extent a little bit better so that everybody involved in the sport can get that little bit more out of it. But I, I sincerely want to thank you for what you're doing for having me and spending the time with me. I, I really appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. It has been a pleasure today having you join us. And with this being the la last episode in our five-part series, uh, it would be wrong of me not to take this opportunity to uh, put my thanks back out again to Stuart Armstrong, uh, Dr. Ed Coughlin, Rob Gray, Ted Soikinen, and of course our guest today, Wade Russell. Thank you, Wade, to you. Thank you to the other guests. Um, Hope to stay in contact with you and, and continue to cross paths and hopefully we'll get to work together again so, someday down the road and, and share on these topics and, and, and put our heads together and come up with some new ideas for coach development and player development. So again, on behalf of myself, all the coaches listening, and of course, Hockey Eastern Ontario, Wade, thank you so much for joining us today. And to all of our previous guests, thank you.